Atoms form bonds when their orbitals overlap, and this overlap creates molecular orbitals, which are quantum states that extend over the whole molecule. So unlike valence bond theory, which sees electrons as localized between atoms in hybrid orbitals, molecular orbital theory treats bonding electrons as delocalized wave functions, giving a more accurate and quantum level view of bonding. For atomic orbitals to actually combine into molecular orbitals, three key conditions must be met. One, their symmetries must match. Two, they must overlap significantly and three, their energies must be similar. Also, the number of molecular orbitals formed always equals the number of atomic orbitals involved. And these molecular orbitals are filled from lowest to highest energy following the Aufbau principle, just like atomic orbitals. So take hydrogen or H2 as an example. Each hydrogen atom contributes a 1s atomic orbital, which could have two electrons. So we need to combine these orbitals into two new molecular orbitals that could in theory accommodate four electrons. So we can have a bonding orbital or sigma 1s and an antibonding orbital or sigma star 1s. In the bonding orbital, the wave functions interfere constructively concentrating electron density between the two nuclei. And this region allows the electrons to be attracted to both protons simultaneously, stabilizing the molecule and lowering its energy. But on the other hand, antibonding orbitals arrive from destructive interference, creating a node, which is an area of zero electron density between the two nuclei. And this lack of electron shielding increases repulsions between the positively charged nuclei, making the antibonding orbital actually higher in energy. So although these electrons in the antibonding orbitals are still attracted to each other's nucleus, they must instead overcome the increased repulsions resulting in this destabilizing effect. So quantum mechanically, this can be explained by the interference of wave functions. The bonding orbital results from constructive interference between the 1s orbitals, while the antibonding orbital results from destructive interference, producing a node. So mathematically, we write these orbitals as combinations of atomic wave functions. So the probability density of the bonding orbital is given as the absolute value of psi squared equals the absolute value of n times w1 plus w2 squared. And for antibonding, we have the absolute value of psi squared equals the absolute value of n times w1 minus w1 squared. And here W1 and W2 are the atomic wave functions for the 1s orbitals, and n is the normalization constant that ensures the probability is conserved. So to illustrate this, let's assign some arbitrary values to the atomic wave functions. Let's say that for W1 we have 0 0.60 and for W2, we have the same, so 0 0.60. And we'll just ignore units for simplicity. Let's also set the normalization constant n to one over the square root of two, which is approximately 0 0.707. And this is just for demonstration, but in reality, this value depends on the degree of orbital overlap. Anyway, for the bonding orbital, we calculate psi to be 0 0.707 times 0 0.60 plus 0 0.60, which equals approximately 0 0.85, remembering significant figures. And the probability density is then the absolute value of this squared, which gives approximately 0 0.72. And this degree of electron density indicates significant bonding in the bonding orbital. Now for the antibonding orbital, we have psi equals 0 0.707 times 0 0.60 minus 0 0.60, which equals zero. And this gives zero probability density or a node, meaning there is no electron density between the atoms and no bonding occurs. But what happens if the orbitals are out of phase? 
And with molecular orbitals, that simply means their wave functions have opposite signs. They're misaligned in terms of their peaks and troughs. So let's say that W1 equals 0 0.60 and W2 equals negative 0 0.60. For the bonding orbital, we have psi equals 0 0.707 times 0 0.60 plus negative 0 0.60 and that would give us zero, which means we have a node or zero bonding for the bonding orbital. But for the anti-bonding orbital, we have psi equals 0 0.707 times 0 0.60 minus negative 0 0.60, which actually gives us 0 0.85, and the absolute value squared of that is approximately 0 0.72, and this means with an out of phase wave function, we have higher electron density, but now outside the bonding region or in the anti-bonding orbital. So to visualize why this happens, imagine two spherical orbitals, each holding an electron. When they're in phase, they're synchronized. You can picture the electrons being in sync, avoiding each other's repulsions and reinforcing the overlap in the bonding region. But if one is inverted, which is out of phase, they interfere destructively in the middle and repel. Another analogy I like to imagine is clapping your hands. If both hands move toward each other at the same time, which is in phase, you get a clear clap. That's bonding. But if one hand pulls away while the other hand comes forward, which is out of phase, they miss. No sound, no bond. And interestingly, if both hands are moving out of sync, but in a repeating pattern, they can still meet at the same time and create a clap, they just started at different points. So this is similar to how out of phase wave functions can still generate an interactions just in a different way, forming an anti-bonding orbital instead. Now moving on to the labels we use for molecular orbitals like sigma and sigma star. These are descriptions of their symmetry. Sigma means the orbital is symmetric around the axis connecting the nuclei, so rotating it doesn't change its phase or symmetry. The asterisk indicates an antibonding orbital with a nodal plane that is orthogonal or at a right angle to the internuclear axis. And these symmetry labels help us understand and predict molecular behavior in a systematic way, and we'll actually use them a lot in the future. So once we've built the molecular orbital diagram for a molecule like H2 and assigned the correct symmetry labels we've just talked about, we can assign its electrons. H2 has two electrons, both of which go into the sigma 1s bonding orbital. And that gives us the ground state configuration of sigma 1s2. And from this, we can predict two things. One, the magnetism. The electrons are paired in this case, so H2 is diamagnetic, as observed with experiments, but also we can predict the bond order, which is the bonding orbitals minus the anti-bonding orbitals divided by two. So in this case, we have two bonding orbitals minus zero anti-bonding orbitals, which gives us one, meaning we have a single bond. And bond order actually gives us insights and ideas into the bond strength, length, and stability and it explains why some molecules like helium-2 don't exist. And this is because in helium-2, the number of bonding and anti-bonding electrons is equal. So the bond order is zero and there's no net attraction, no stable molecule. So from here, we can explore more complex diatomic molecules like lithium-2 and oxygen-2 using molecular orbital diagrams. Let's start with lithium-2. First, we draw the Lewis structure, then write the electron configuration for each lithium atom. So we have 1s2, 2s1. Both atoms have a 1s and 2s orbital that are close in energy and their symmetries are compatible, so they can overlap to form molecular orbitals. The 1s orbitals form sigma 1s and sigma star 1s orbitals and the 2s orbitals form sigma 2s and sigma star 2s orbitals. 
We ensure symmetry labels based on the type of overlap. So sigma for bonding and sigma star for anti-bonding are correct and fill the molecular orbitals according to the alpha principle. So again, from lowest to highest energy. So now you'll notice that the 1s orbitals are fully filled, but they also completely cancel each other out because one bonding and one anti-bonding pair are present. So they contribute zero bond order. And this shows that the inner or core electrons usually don't contribute to the bonding. It's the valence electrons that matter. In this case, the 2s electrons are the bonding electrons. And that's what we see with general chemistry. So lithium-2 has a bond order of one, meaning it's weakly single bonded and diatomic. Now let's look at oxygen-2. But before building the molecular orbital diagram, we need to introduce a new type of orbital symmetry, pi. In the Lewis structure, oxygen has a double bond, which includes a pi bond. And in molecular orbital theory, pi orbitals form through side-by-side -side or perpendicular overlap of p orbitals. So bonding pi orbitals have a node along the internuclear axis, since there's no electron density directly between the nuclei. They also have an antibonding or pi star orbital that have two nodes along the internuclear axis and another between the two lobes. It's also important to note the energy trend. In bonding orbitals, sigma is lower in energy than pi because head-on overlap is stronger but anti-bonding orbitals such as pi star are actually lower than sigma star because sigma star places electron density directly between the nuclei, increasing repulsions, whereas pi star orbitals being off axis avoid this, making them slightly more stable. Now that I've explained that, we can go back to constructing our molecular orbital diagram for oxygen two. So we start by drawing the Lewis structure and writing the electron configuration for each oxygen atom. So we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. The 1s and 2s orbitals form bonding and anti-bonding combinations, but since they're fully filled, they cancel out and don't affect the bonding. So next we look at the 2p orbitals. We have three orbitals from each atom, so we can bind the p orbitals to form sigma 2p, pi 2p, another pi 2p, and the anti-bonding orbitals. And remember, pi is higher in energy than sigma, but anti-pi is lower in energy than anti-sigma. Also, you might have noticed that the sigma p molecular orbitals look different from the s ones. And this is because the p orbitals have a different shape to begin with, but they still satisfy the symmetry descriptions of sigma and anti-sigma, and that's what's important. So filling in the diagram with the electrons according to the Aufbau principle, we find two unpaired electrons in the anti-bonding pi orbitals. And this explains why oxygen is one, paramagnetic, meaning it has slight magnetic behavior, and two, why it's so reactive, because it has these two unpaired electrons in this high energy orbital. And with that, that wraps up the video. I'll leave a practice question for comprehension. And in the next video, we'll explore more complex examples. Otherwise, thanks for watching.